Hello folks, uh, so my name is Martin Shaw and in a way the next half an hour is going to seem very different probably to what has just transpired, but uh, first of all thank you for such a nourishing and interesting talk. Uh, and in my own strange wayward manner, uh, I hope to touch on some of the themes that we just brushed up against. So I am this really kind of endangered species, I'm this thing called a mythologist. And I hope over the next half an hour, somewhere in the room, like a little echo location, there may be a pulse and there may be other people that think, well, maybe I'll be a mythologist too. So I'll start with a really, really ancient fairy tale. Once upon a time, long, long time ago, there was a hunter. And the hunter lived alone. He was a young man. And one night he was coming back to his hut. He is tired and he is alone. Hasn't gone well that day in the forest. And as he's coming back to the hut, he sees something that really frightens him. He sees a little trail of smoke coming from the chimney of the hut. Pads over the blue snow to the door. Looks in. Strange thing. Somebody has cooked a meal. There's like a stew, there's delicious herbs in the air. There's no vegan option for a thousand miles. <laughs> Just. And there is his old knackered clothes. Someone has bothered to kind of at least put them in a pile. There's some sort of warmth. There's some kind of homemaking in the hut. It's very touching. But he doesn't know who did it. All week long, he comes back to the hut and the same scene transpires until finally he doubles back a little early. He's moving across the snow, comes to the door, peers in. There is a woman with, his back, with her back turned to him, and she is leaning over the stew, and she's cooking, and she's grinding herbs, and she's singing low in some ancient song that it hurts our heart to even think about. There's red hair pouring down her back, and he knows in the way that a hunter would know that this is fox woman dreaming. This is a woman that is only part woman, part fox, part spirit. And she knows in the way that all women know that she's being watched. So she turns. And she looks at him and she wastes no time with the glitter of her green eyes. She says, I will be the woman of this hut. And the hunter looks at her and he says, yeah, yeah, it's called gratitude. It was a sweet scene that night, I've got to tell you. For the first time they could cook together. They knew a lot of jokes. They knew a lot of songs. And they would sit down together just by one little flickering candle. And something moved like a clear wine between them. Something we are all a little jealous of to this day. But here's the thing about the fox woman. All fox women have pelts. Now, the more rural amongst you, of which there are a few, I can feel, will know that the pelt of a fox at certain times of the year gives off, how do I put it, a certain regal scent, a strong, <laughs> pungent scent. Now she has her pelt hanging off the door. And as time goes by, as they fall deeper and deeper in love with each other, actually, the pelt starts to release this deep scent. And for a while, the young man can handle it. But after a few weeks, moving into a few months, the scent is everywhere. It's getting into his clothes, it's getting into his traps, it's getting into his head. And so one night, he says to her, and this is old language, bright pulse of my whole understanding, sky woman of the dawn, you are more tuneful than the fiddle, you are whiter than the swan on the pool, you are a ship in full sail on a mistless wave. You were the apple blossom woman. How can I have lived in the absence of your sweet smile? But there's just this one thing. Oh, just this one thing. Would 
would you consider getting rid of the pope? I mean, we're happy together, aren't we? You know, we've worked it all out. But that scent is so strong, so deep, and so wild. I'm begging you, please, let's just get rid of the pelt. And she looked at him just like you looked at him, with that kind of sad, glittery thing in your eyes, and she tried to ignore it. Months pass, and months pass, and time is a flying arrow. Until finally, again, he says, look, I told you once, Get rid of the fucking pelt. <laughs> and in the morning, when he woke, the woman, the pelt, and the scent had gone. And they say and say truly, to this day, the hunter stands lonely in his whole body at the entrance of the hut for the scent of the fox or just an old fairy tale so many years ago when I was about 23 I ended up, believe it or not on a mountain top in a place called Kada Idris in Snowdonia some of you will know it so they call it the seat of Arthur and I sat on top of it, alone and without food, for four days and nights. Now the old poets say, even spending one night up there, you'll come down mad dead or a poet. So I tried four to make absolutely sure. And I was just a kid from Broccoli, by the way, just down the road. Broccoli boy. Now, that experience recalibrated me in some way. And as I was listening to Rupert talking, and this... There is some sort of truth, I think, in morphic resonance. It reminded me of the time that I was out on the hill. Old Aboriginal teachers say, modern society, with all its brilliance, is about three days deep. <coughs> about three days deep. And on the fourth day, out on the hill, or on the tundra, or in the desert, or the forest, you may experience something they call Wild land dreaming. Now what that is, is a strange moment where rather than you dreaming, you get dreamt. You get dreamt. And it happened to me, this little 23-year-old kid. It happened to me. And I've lived in the consequence of it for the last 20 years. So the stories that I love, and the reason I'm here today to be a a little Shetland pony advocating something as archaic as myth is because I, I don't ever want to hear another freaking story about the earth again. But what I am curious about is could we be in the presence of stories where the earth itself speaks through them? Could something actually speak through the storyteller? The old woman, the old man, the young woman, whoever you are. Another example. So I've come off the hill and I'm sort of, I'm back in Broccoli, I'm sort of drinking myself to death in Deptford by this point. Uh, you know the feeling. And I hear about this old Lakota Sioux medicine man called Wallace Black Elk. I mean, what a name. And someone says, Martin, you are in such a fix, you need to go and see Wallace Black Elk. Now, why is a guy like Wallace Black Elk in Britain anyway? Well, he was over giving what you could loosely call uh, lectures, but really he was a ceremonialist. And he turns up in, uh, we were in, we were in Wales somewhere, and the first time I saw him, I don't, know, I don't know when it was the last time you loved somebody utterly, when you saw them, you just utterly loved them, they claimed you in some manner. So he was the first real human being I'd ever seen. I didn't know they made these people anymore. I just didn't know they were made. He turns up, Yay high, his hair hasn't been cut since it was five. And he has these two plaits pouring down to his belt. One of them is very neat, very sweet. The other one has clearly just been ripped to shreds. And I said to him, Grandpa, um, what's happened to this plait? And he looked at me and he said, My wife has died. My wife has died. 
Uh, and he said, this is the correct way to demonstrate the grief of being without my beloved, being without the bright pulse of my whole understanding. And I just thought it was the most elegant thing that I'd ever seen. It was the most truthful thing that I'd ever seen, that he was, he was magnificent in his heartbreak. So you can imagine now, I'm just wandering, you know like ducks wander over after the big duck? I'm just wandering around. I'll do anything for this guy. <laughs> now he used to run something that you will know of called sweat lodges. Yeah, you roughly know. So you know what a sauna is like. It's a hot, dark place where praying goes on with this guy, Wallace. Now, here's the rub. You have to heat the rocks very, very hot to get them in the lodge for the whole thing to work, for the water to go on and the whole thing to get hot. So, we're outside, it's Wales. We're heating up the rocks. Wallace is pottering around in the background somewhere and I'm running the team heating the rocks. But I can see overhead these enormous clouds, these alpha clouds coming, these Welsh irritable my Franway clouds coming over from the hills of Ceredigion. I mean, it's grim. And I know they're going to blow out our little fire. And so I said, Grandpa, there's no way this fire's going to work. These clouds are serious business. Uh, I, I'm so sorry it's not going to work. And he looked at me and he said, well, you, you know why they're here, don't you? And I said, oh, nope. And he said, oh, oh, they're here because we're doing this. And they want a story. He said, here's real old language. They want to be courted like a courtship. I said, really? And he said, check this out. So he picks up his pipe, his chinupa, and for 15 freaking minutes, he speaks to those clouds as if they were intimate, old beloveds. He praises them in 12 different ways. He those that were there will tell you those clouds blushed by the time he finished. <laughs> it touched me deeper than all of Shakespeare. I was just like, oh, this is how adults are meant to behave. This is the world that I want to live in. So he aims the pipe and then he says, oh, I, I don't even come from around here. It's your turn, little one. So I was like, Jesus. There's a phrase in America where they describe someone, they say, He's all hat and no cattle. And this was my all hat and no cattle <laughs> moment. Because I tell you, when Wallace used to speak, his jaw was like a mead hall and his words were like flowers. They were like galloping ponies in the room. My mouth was a concrete prison where words went to die. <laughs> <laughs> my tongue was a kind of death row for eloquence. It didn't land well for me that day, and I carried myself sobbing uncontrollably into the woods, you know. But by the end of it, he kind of said to me, he said, look, I'm going back to South Dakota. You could come, and this isn't an exceptional thing. I wasn't exceptional that night, but he said you could do that, or you could uh, stay here. You've got six hours to think about it. And I knew, and this killed me, it kills me now to think about it, that I couldn't go with him because I come from this place, uh, or I'm here in this place. And so I said, Grandpa, I can't come back. I can't become a kind of little, little Lakota or whatever could happen. And he said, oh, well, in that case, you're just going to have to do this other thing. And I said, what's that? And he said, you went out on the hill for four days and nights, didn't you? And I was like, I was quite proud of this. I was like, I did. I did. And he said, yeah, now you're going to go out for one, two, three, four years four years. He said, it's all right, you can eat. You know, we have ravitas, that kind of thing. But you've got to go out for four years. If you're not coming with me, you're going to spend four years getting broken open by weather patterns. Four years learning the deep dreaming of the animals and the old ground boned dreams of this country. And if you survive that, maybe you'll have a story to tell and maybe you'll have eloquence in your jaw. He went away and I never saw him again. So that is what transpired. I left Broccoli. I did. I know it's hard, but I did. And I spent four years living in a black tent on a succession, succession of little English hills trying to find out if 
It's maybe not wilderness, but wildness could still survive, even thrive around here. And whilst I was doing that, I became a storyteller. I don't know, I don't know when your heart was last broken. I don't know when you were last depressed. I don't know when you last went through a serious illness or a divorce. But at some point, and I bet it's happened to you already, something will arrive that is so vast in its soulful implications, normal language does not befit it. You know, Leonard Cohen says to us, you know, when something really shitty happens to you, give it the eloquence of language and raise it so you're not seduced by your own wound. Don't be seduced by your own wound. Make it artful. Don't just behold the beauty. Make it. So I found that telling ancient myths were a way of articulating things I didn't want to talk about personally. Does that make sense? I didn't want to say, she left me. Daphne's gone. But I could say, once upon a time, there was a king and a queen in a great forest. And in that way, you have put your arm around the whole room. And as I was listening to Rupert talk so brilliantly a few minutes ago, I had this thought that occurred. I thought, could, could myth curate morphic resonance? Could it be a place, in the same way you described ritual, where creativity and repetition meet? In my language, I'd say discipline is the dance partner of wildness. Discipline is the dance partner of wildness. So the more myths you gather, the more fairy tales you gather, you begin to form a kind of root system. Say if you were, I've got a little girl, I've got a daughter who's 11 and a half. Uh, Dulcie, some of us know her. Now, if Dulcie come, came from the Mediterranean, in a few years, she, and this is some time back, would be taken into the presence of the temple of Artemis. Now what that means is she would be wrapped in a bear skin, she would learn how to snuffle, very important. She would learn all sorts of elaborate riddles and stories before she was out in the marketplace, before she was in the realm of courting men or women or whoever she was gonna be with. In other words, she would know the mythic ground that she stood upon. Gave her guts, gave her courage, gave her eloquence. So the school of myth that was briefly described is this place uh, where you can come and find out about that. You may be sensing by now, I'm not, I'm not a very good sound bitey or one night stand type of guy. So if you ever wanted to teach, study with me, I teach for one year and we just glimpse the wing, the wing tip uh, of what this is all about. Now I'll tell one last little story and maybe we have a couple of moments for any questions you may have. Once upon a time, once upon a time, there was a village. In the village, the thing they loved more than anything else was on a Friday night, they would gather and they would sing, they'd tell stories, they'd dance, something like that, they would celebrate. And providing you could do that, it was a great scene to be part of. But there was one little lad in the village who just couldn't quite cut it. I mean, God Almighty every Friday night. He was relentless with his horrible poems, his awful dancing, you know, his dad dancing, the whole thing. And they, after a while, people are just freaking throwing things at him as soon as he turns up. So they gave him a name. They said, they called him No Song. Imagine that. Imagine being called that. No Song. Pass the salt, No Song. Go and get us another chicken from the shed, No Song. Now, when you were given a name like that, you will end up at the very edge of the village. And there's two ways to be at the edge of a village, as we know. One is very beautiful, solitude. Isolation, not so. So it's Friday night, and they're all in the main hut. <laughs> it's, you know what it is. They're in there, they're having the time of their lives. No song is carrying his limping, wounding, wounded phrase, uh, frame to the very edge of the village because this is one thing that he can do. He's a fabulous hunter. There is some kind of love in him that brings animals to him. He has the yellow breast of the moon in his heart. 
and they come because he smells good. So he cooks this amazing stew again. <laughs> oh, we're back to the stews. And all the scent's coming out, and it's a frosty night. Now, wandering through the forest, nearby the little village, is Lord Coyote of the Four Quarters. Now, Coyote is always hungry, and he is always horny. He is led by desire. He's led by appetite. So he turns up, and of course he's standing up, and he's smoking, because that's what Coyote does. It's one of those, is it like those little licorice ones, the little black ones? Does anybody smoke anymore? I can't remember. <laughs> so, Lord Coyote's there, and he, he strolls out. He strolls out, and he sees the young man, and he's cooking. And he says, uh, smells good, smells good. Uh, you know, how much for the cauldron? What do you want for the cauldron? And the young man says, oh, no, you, you, have, you, you can have a bowl. And he says, Lord Coyote of the Four Quarters, do you think I want a freaking bowl? I want it all. I am led by desire. I want it all. And what do you want? Now, no song did not have to think very long for what he wanted. He said this. Give me big song. Give me a song. When I sing it, the old men think of God and the women think of love. Coyote said, I can do that. I can do that. But you have to understand serious consequence comes with this gift. He said, I'm ready, I'm ready. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? And he said, you can only sing big song when it is very deep time, sacred time, aboriginal time, when babies are being born, men and women are dying or being married. The, the really holy times, that is when you use big song. Do you understand I am binding you, little man? He said, yeah, yeah, okay. He says, all right, come in front of me then. And Coyote stands up and the boy kneels down. And Coyote blows. He blows Big Song at his chest. When he opens his eyes, the cauldron is gone, Coyote is gone turns around and he freaking runs towards the center of the region. It's like chariots of fire running, that slow down running. He's running like that, boots the door off his hinges. You know, someone's at the front, you know, and she moved through the fence, get out of the way! <laughs> and he starts to sing. And just as Lord Coyote had said, the old men thought of God, the women thought of love. And as the Irish say, the whole place was in radiant contentment. From that day onwards, they gave him a new name. Sings beautifully. That is a very dangerous name to have. Time passes and time passes and time passes. And he begins to forget in the way that we forget where our gifts are coming from. Because he's singing all the time now. You can't shut the man up. You know, if he's on a, if he's on a date, which they had even in these archaic villages, if it wasn't going well, if he just hummed a few notes of big song, the love light would spark in her eye again, and the evening would go a sweet way. He would be in the tavern, and he would be out of money. He would just mutter a few verses of big song, and the foaming beer would pour into his belly for the rest of the night. He cannot remember a time when he couldn't do this. Surely I am the font of this strange genius. After a while, he is sitting on the corner. He sings it all day and all night. You can't stop him from singing it. 
But standing in the tree line is Lord Coyote. And he says, indeed, indeed, indeed. And one night, when the boy was sleeping, Coyote came and he took the song away. That's that. I get a lot of emails about that saying, sorry, I fixed the ending. I fixed the ending. Someone called Joseph Campbell, who's an interesting resource to go to if you're touched by stories, he used to say, we all gag on true doctrine. We all gag on true doctrine. In other words, I wouldn't trust stories without difficult bits. Because in a way, speech is how we taste our ancestors. Speech is how we taste the roughage of those that came before. And wherever I go, people are saying to me all the time now, we need a new story. We're living in times we've never been in before. Do you not agree? To a degree, I agree. But the whole business of myth, and I'm winding this up now, is this. Myth means no author. It isn't someone out there on a laptop tapping away at the front of this little hotel that I believe is going to hit the kind of resonance that a real myth involves, because a myth is to do with the passage of space and time. It has to pass through many jaws and many souls. That's not to mean for a second we shouldn't be sitting out there looking for new stories. But my passion is just ensuring the root system attached to all of these great sparks uh, of ingenuity. Does that make sense? <laughs>